Uh, this morning, we begin a new series called When God Breaks In, A Journey Through Acts. So we're going to be going over the next two months, the significant events in the book of Acts. Again, all of Acts is significant, but we really want to draw out some of those particular events that took place where God showed up in a powerful and miraculous way. So to start off the series this morning, uh, my good friend Ryan will be coming up. He, uh, again, I love him. So proud of him as a brother and friend of mine. He got his master's at 21, one of the youngest students at Fuller to ever get their master's. Now, he's a professor at William Jessup University. He teaches Bible and theology, and we are just blessed to have him as our youth pastor. Would you welcome Ryan Murphy as he shares? Hey, good morning. It is good to be here. Hey, um, you look so alive. 11 a.m., you've had a chance to wake up. Why don't you just turn to your neighbor and say, you just look so alive this morning. There's something about, I don't know, your face. It's just, it's not dead. It's alive. Hey, well, I want to I wanna celebrate something just with you guys as our, as our church family. Uh, this week, Morgan and I had a crazy week. We actually bought a house this week. So... There was actually an article floating around the internet that went viral a couple weeks ago about uh, how millennials aren't able to buy houses because they eat too much avocado toast. And some of you are waiting for the punchline, but that's literally it. Someone wrote this article saying uh, they're spending all their money on avocado toast. Did anyone see that? So Morgan and I just said, hey, we're going we're gonna to beat that. We're going to eat avocado toast and we're going to buy a house. So... Uh, so we did it. We actually, um, we've, been, we've been delivering groceries to, the, to these neighborhoods over here for six years now. Um, and, and a couple years ago, a few of us decided, hey, we're just going to make an intentional commitment to live on mission in the middle of a neighborhood. Because some of you know, church is about being a family beyond the church building. So we're going to be a family in the neighborhood. So it's more than just a house for us. It really is a home in the center of a place we're committed to see God's kingdom come. And so, um, we're, as we, and one of, one of our major values we had in wanting to buy a house is we needed a space for community to meet in. We have various discipleship groups and things that meet in our living room. And so we're touring this house, and the one thing it didn't have was a large meeting room until somebody comes in and says, you know, it would if you just tore down this wall. So we're like, we're going to do it. We're going to turn on the wall. So we brought in the right constructors, to fi- uh, con- con- contractors to figure out um, if it would be like a load-bearing wall and all those things you have to figure out. I don't know. Who, who just doesn't know about construction? That's me. I don't, I don't even know. So I have to figure out all these things, figure out we can do it. So we get the keys. I think it was on Tuesday, the very next day on Wednesday, I'm having a meeting with my dad to try and figure out a schedule uh, to tear down this wall. Um, so where are the schedule people at? Who's a schedule person? And then who's just to go with the flow? Whatever happens, happens person. So, so I'm there trying to come up with this schedule, and my dad's a go with the flow person. So as I'm talking to him about my availability, the weeks I'm able to do this, he literally stands up in the middle of while I'm talking, takes, this, uh, takes the drill, goes to the cabinets, and starts unscrewing them. And as I'm telling him about the hours I'm working this next week, he says, hold this, it's going to fall. <laughs> And then about 20 minutes later, our wall looks like this. And then we call some of our community to come over. Four hours later, the wall looks like this. And then the very next day, um, we brought actually a discipleship group over to our house to tear down those beams. And then it looks like this the very next day. And if you'll notice, uh, there, see this beautiful brick pillar that we're going to leave exposed here that we found behind the wall? So we decided, you know, if we're going to be millennials owning a house, what good is it if you can't put it on Pinterest with some exposed bricks? So we're going to pose with our avocado toast next to that brick, and it's just going to be a beautiful, um, beautiful thing. You can, you can take that picture down. Uh, but as I was tearing down a wall, guys, it's just such a cathartic release to swing a hammer into something. Um, it is a little bit weird, though, to buy a house and then break it the very next day. There's something you have to get over there. But as I was swinging that hammer, I just had this unique thought about what a prophetic moment this is that we're tearing down walls to make room for community. And there's a moment at the end of the book of John, right after Jesus um, dies on the cross and rises again, um, that his disciples don't know that he's risen from the dead. So they're actually hiding in a room. They've locked the doors because they're afraid that the government's going to come after them because they just came after his, their leader, killed him. And so they're, they're kind of hiding. And on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, 
peace be with you. Somehow, even though the doors were locked, Jesus walked through the walls to be with his community. And I think the question for us this morning is what walls do we have in our hearts that Jesus wants to walk through to be with us? Just close your eyes. Holy Spirit, we love your presence. We thank you for that song sung in worship, that the spirit that you would break out and you would break every wall down. Lord, I'm asking right now in Jesus' name where there's walls of anxiety. God, we believe for them to come down this morning in Jesus' name where there's walls of a lack of faith with finances. We believe for them to come down in Jesus' name where there's fear about the future. God, we're believing for those to come down in Jesus' name where there's not peace in families. We're believing for those to come down in Jesus' name. You know, just with eyes closed, we're going to pray a little bit more at the end of the service, but just with eyes closed, even right now, I just feel like the Holy Spirit's stirring in hearts right now. But just with eyes closed, if any of those things um, were you, there's a wall that's in your heart that's coming. Can you just slip your hand up really quick, just with eyes closed? Yeah, Father, we believe for those walls to come down this morning in the name and authority of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking for faith to rise in this room that even walls we've lived with for years. We believe this morning that by the power of your spirit and your cross, you can break them. In Jesus' name, come and do it, Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name, if you're expectant for God to move, say amen. Amen. Hey, well, we are starting our series um, in the book of Acts, and Acts actually starts uh, where Luke ends. They are written by the same person. Luke is kind of like part one, um, and then Acts is kind of part two. And and so they're written by this guy named Luke, and what uh, many of us know is Luke's actually a physician. Uh, And the reason why we know that Luke, the author of these books, is a physician is because there's actually the most, out of any book in the New Testament, there's the most instances of a Greek word that only occurs once in the entire New Testament in the book of Luke, and most of the time, it's medical terminology. So it's a word that's only used once in the entire New Testament, and it's in Luke. It's medical terms that are things that Jesus then heals. And so because of that, uh, we think, scholars think, that Luke is written by a physician in order to know those unique medical terms. But here's why it's important for us, is that Luke is a doctor in a field of science, and he says at the beginning of Luke that his job in writing is to set out an orderly account of what Jesus does. And so Luke is this whole story of of orderly accounts written by this physician, this scientist thinker who wants to give factual proofs for who Jesus is, what he did, how he lived, how he did miracles, died. And then Acts part two is kind of like the continuation of how Jesus breaks in in the person of the Holy Spirit. And so as we go into this series as a church, really the question for us is how is God going to break into our hearts, into our lives, into our cities? And it's like this instruction manual of how it happens. And at the end of Luke, um, Jesus gives us instructions in Luke 24. He's about to ascend uh, to heaven. And this is such a great time for us to read this because actually um, on Thursday, it was 40 days after Easter. And that's when we as the church celebrate the ascension of Jesus. 40 days um, after Easter is when we believe he ascended 2,000 years ago. And then 50 days next Sunday is Pentecost. So this is the moment uh, that we just celebrated on Thursday. Jesus is about to ascend uh, to heaven. And he says, you, um, say me, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I... I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he tells them to wait for the promise of his Father, which we know now is the Holy Spirit that's about to get poured out in Acts chapter 2. But what I love about this is he doesn't send them out to preach right away. He tells them to wait for the power. Because how many of you know, preaching alone is not enough. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. It's no good for me to just tell you about who Jesus is because the Holy Spirit wants to encounter you yourself so you can meet him for yourself. And I just feel like, I just sense in the room, maybe there's a lot of us in here, maybe you went to church when you were a kid or you've grown up in church, you've been in church environments, you've heard a lot of words, but it's time for the Holy Spirit to encounter you with this power and actually set you free. Jesus didn't just die to forgive us of our sins. He actually died to set us free of them. And there's an encounter with power that Jesus invites his disciples to have where he says, hey, it's not enough just for the words and the preaching. You need the power of the Holy Spirit, so wait. 
And so it's here where we jump into the story in Acts chapter 1, where they um, are waiting. And, and in Acts, Luke kind of recaps what just happened. Um, and, and it goes in, in chapter 6. It says, so when they had come together, they asked him, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So a couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, Vacaville, and, and Morgan was, uh, she was at Starbucks working in the morning, and I was, I was an hour away in Vacaville, and what she was going to do is I'd ridden with a friend uh, to Vacaville, and then Morgan was going to drive up later in, in our car, and we were going to drive together to San Francisco. And so I'm in Vacaville, and Morgan calls me at about noon, getting home from Starbucks, and says, Ryan, I left my keys in the house. I can't get in the house. I'm like, oh no, I'm an hour away. So I, I do some calls trying to figure out who might have an extra key. Um, my parents are in San Francisco. Nobody has an extra key. So I kind of resolve, okay, I'm going to have to borrow somebody's car, drive to, back home, and then drive back just to give her the key so that she can then take our car and drive to Vacaville so we can ride together to San Francisco. And, and so I'm getting ready. I'm gearing up. I'm going to call her um, to tell her this. And as I call her, she answers the phone and says, Ryan, don't worry about it. I broke in. I'm like, you what? How? She's like, don't, don't worry about it. I'm going to be in Vacaville in an hour. I broke into the house, and it's okay. And I'm like, but I put safety, security things in the windows so things like this don't happen. And come to find out, she popped the screen. The security thing, for whatever reason, wasn't in there. She slid the window in, and she broke and entered into our house. So, um, you know, she's actually up for hire now. If you need someone to break and enter for you, um, she's very good at it. But God wants to break in to our hearts, and oftentimes we put our own disguises up of security, but God knows just how to get in to encounter our hearts. And a lot of times we put up our own walls of security and defense and fear and anxiety and all these things, but God is so good at doing what we least expect and coming in in a way we least expect it. And this is actually what happens here, is, he, is he's breaking in, his kingdom is breaking in. This is a unique point in human history, and they think he's going to come with a political power which is very appropriate. It's what they thought the prophecies were pointing to. All the things that they'd read in the Old Testament pointed to this Messiah figure who would lead the nation of Israel in a political way. And even, especially the book of Daniel talks a lot about this, which was a common book that would have been read um, in this time. And so they say, hey, you said you're the Messiah. You rose from the dead. You proved it. Is this it? Is this the time that you're going to be the political savior and he says, I'm not going to save you with politics. I'm going to save you with my presence. Yeah. And it's not in the power of politics. It's actually in the power of my presence. He kind of dismisses it. He says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. And then in verse 8, he says, but you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we have, I think, Acts 1.8 to put up on the screen. But you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Here's what I love. Jesus flips it on them. They say, what time are you going to restore the kingdom? And he says, you will be my witnesses. It's not my job to bring the kingdom. It's yours. And I can't help but think that this is a culmination moment of something that's been happening throughout the entire story of Scripture. I know a lot of us know this story, but some of us don't. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates heavens and earth, and he creates humanity, and he actually gives them some authority. He says, go and rule over the earth. In Genesis 1.27, humanity is designed to rule and have authority. But then in Genesis chapter 3, something uh, sad happens, and the serpent comes. How many of you know the story, right? The serpent comes and, and says to Eve, eat the fruit. And Eve, who has authority given by God, says yes to the serpent rather than to God. And authority happens when you choose to obey somebody. So what Eve actually does is she gives authority to the serpent that God had given to her. Because she says yes to the serpent. And that's why in the New Testament, there's lots of verses about, and say the serpent represents Satan. And there's lots of verses in the New Testament in 1 John about how the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Um, the New Testament often calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. Because there's an authority that was released on that day. And on that day, all of a sudden, everything that was right in the Garden of Eden becomes wrong. 
And there's an introduction of these things which ever since then we as humanity have been wrestling with. Number one is sin, um, where, where we don't do what God wants us to do. The very first sin that was committed on that day. Number two is sickness. How many of you know that God's design for us is not to live sick? God never authored sickness. He didn't design sickness. In the Garden of Eden, there's no sickness, there's no death, but all of a sudden on this day, now they're going to die. There's this introduction. And then number three is Satan, where how many, and I know this sounds weird for some of our American Western thinking, um, but there's there's real demonic forces at work on earth. And, and for some of us, we might not directly see it, but how many of you know that there's anxiety that can try and come on people, depression, fear, suicide, suicidal thoughts. And I know there's real clinical diagnoses of these things, but sometimes it just feels like, what the heck? Where did that come from? That's not me. Um, That's the enemy. We believe it. The Rock of Roosevelt, that is the enemy who's coming against you with these things. God did not design anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts. It has to come from somewhere. And so there's this introduction of these things, sin, sickness, Satan. And then all of a sudden, the rest of the Old Testament is about how humanity is wrestling with these different things. But there's these glimmers of hope of a different kingdom of how God designed his will to operate. There's Joseph who rules with righteousness and authority in the midst of chaos. There's David who comes and rules again with righteousness, justice. And what I love about David is he doesn't just rule out of a place of political power. He rules out of a place of presence. We have psalms of David resting in the presence of the Lord. Then there's the prophets who come and say, hey, your job, humanity, is to follow God, not to follow all these other voices that are speaking to you. And then when Jesus comes on the scene, he says something so significant in Mark chapter 1. And Mark was actually the very first gospel that was ever written. Um, and this is the very, these are the very first words of Jesus in the first gospel that was ever written. It's very significant. Mark writes that after John, talking about John the Baptist, was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. And this word gospel uh, was actually, it's not a word that the church invented. It's a Greek word that means good news. And it was a Roman word that the emperor would use when he would send messages that represented him. So when someone would come into a town, a messenger of the king would come into a town. They'd say, hey, this is the gospel of Caesar. This is the good news of Caesar. So when Jesus comes and says, this is the gospel of God, he's actually saying there's a new king in town. And where you've been experiencing a kingdom of sin, sickness, and Satan, I've come to bring a kingdom of forgiveness, fullness of healing, and freedom. And that's what he says. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. What is he talking about? He's talking about heaven, this place where once and for all sin is obliterated. Sickness is obliterated. Satan is obliterated. And he says, we can show that slide. He's come and he lives a life bringing forgiveness, fullness of healing and freedom. Forgiveness, fullness of healing and freedom. I'm waiting for the slide, just for that dramatic effect here. <laughs> Forgiveness. Fullness. Come on there. Isn't that, I, I just spent so much time coming with this alliteration. It's kind of, so. <laughs> and so Jesus actually lives this life almost like with one foot in heaven where there's access to forgiveness, fullness of healing, and freedom. And he spends his entire life releasing it on earth. And every person he encounters actually encounters what's going on in heaven because Jesus is the place where heaven invades earth. And Luke tells this story about heaven um, all the way throughout. We're in Luke chapter 3. At the moment when Jesus is baptized, it actually says that the heavens were opened. What does that mean? It means uh, the Greek word talks about how it's being torn in two as if it's never going to come together again, as if heaven once and for all has invaded earth in the person of Jesus. And the things that are in heaven, forgiveness, fullness of healing, freedom, are all of a sudden released once and for all on earth. And then Luke goes, on. And and, and Jesus at one point sends his disciples out. He sends them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Why? Because in heaven there's healing. So when we're proclaiming the kingdom of God, we get to bring the things of heaven and release them on earth. And that's how he sends them out. In Luke chapter 10, he does the same exact thing. He sends his disciples out and says, heal the sick who are in the towns you go to and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Why? Because heaven 
heaven isn't just a place we go to when we die. It's actually a place that we get to release here. And I feel like as we go through this, so what's actually happening is our thinking is changing about heaven, where some of us have thought it's just this destination we have when we go to die, but actually it's the destiny of earth. And earth, uh, heaven and earth are supposed to become one. Ephesians 1 even talks about how in Christ, heaven and earth are united. And Luke 11, G, uh, Luke keeps going. Luke 11, Jesus tells his disciples to pray, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. He expects his disciples to live a daily life of seeking God's kingdom of heaven. And then in Luke 22, he actually says to his disciples, Luke, uh, Jesus says, I confer on you a kingdom as my father has confirmed conferred upon me. And it went from him preaching the kingdom and releasing the kingdom to sending his disciples to do the same thing to he, him actually giving them the kingdom to release for themselves. And here's the fullness of it. Here's the fullness of it actually happens. And we're going to learn about it more in Acts chapter two next week. But Jesus is the place where heaven invades earth because he's the king of heaven come to walk on earth. How many of you understand that? He's the king of heaven come to walk on earth. And then he actually tells his disciples, hey, it's actually better that I go away because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And then in Acts chapter 2, the spirit of Jesus comes to live inside of his people. What does that mean? That means that you are now the place where heaven invades earth. Because the king, the spirit of the king of heaven actually lives on the inside of us. If we've said yes to Jesus, what does that mean? That means you've been given a giant key which opens the door into heaven where there's forgiveness, fullness of healing, and freedom. That means that heaven isn't just a place we are going to, but every time we encounter one of those problems, sin, sickness, and Satan, God's actually released the authority to us to see heaven invade and blow those things out of the way. (laughs) To quote Aaron Dolce, the sound of our feet hitting the ground is the sound of heaven touching earth. Because we have access to the fullness of heaven. We have access to the fullness of healing, fullness of freedom. I do want to say, just really quick, a lot of times there's a question as we preach things like this. Of, but but what, if, um, what if the healing doesn't happen? And you never wondered that before, but what if the healing doesn't happen? And here, here's what I would say, is we are in a war that's already been won. We know where the battle's going. We know that Jesus is going to win in the end. And so we don't, so, so when, when we're praying for healing, here's what I want to do. I want to believe that heaven's going to invade that person until the very end. And if it doesn't happen on this side of heaven, guess what? They get to enter into the kingdom of heaven as a victorious warrior who died in battle, not as a defeated warrior. Does that make sense? And so here's our call. Our call is not to give up and be defeated. Our call is to fight until the very end and say, God's kingdom is going to come in power wherever I go. Because I believe in the fullness of Jesus' death, resurrection, and pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And so this is what he says to them. He says, so they say, well, are you going to restore the kingdom? And he says, no, you are going to restore the kingdom. You are my witnesses. In Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He says, you are my witnesses. What does that mean? That means what they've seen in Jesus, they get to show the world. And guess what? We have the same commission today. What we've seen in Jesus, we get to show the world. We're his witnesses. When we've seen love, we get to show love. When we've seen peace, we get to show peace in the midst of extreme anxiety. Where we've seen healing, we get to show healing. Morgan and I had a great opportunity to go um, go to Italy. A couple. I feel like I'm just sharing brag stories, but like, I mean, we, we have some sad things happen too. We, we fight sometimes, but um, we did also go to Italy a couple weeks ago. Um, has anyone ever been to Italy before? It is um, a great, great um, food, I mean, country. Um, <laughs> There's a beautiful thing about Italy is that it is totally socially appropriate to eat pasta and pizza in the same meal. And where in America, people would look at you and say, why aren't you doing Weight Watchers? In Italy, they say, amore, amore. It's just a beautiful thing. So in gelato, okay, I'm getting so distracted. So we're in Italy. 
eating lasagna, and <laughs> there's this table next to us, um, these two girls, and, and if Tracy or Amelia wants to come to the Keys, that would be awesome. So uh, we're, we're in Italy, we're eating lasagna, and, and this table next to us, there's these two girls, um, and they pull out tarot cards. How many of you know what tarot cards are? Anyone know what tarot cards are? So um, tarot cards, it, it's a way of fortune telling, um, and, and at The Rock, we believe that um, the source uh, of tarot cards and fortune telling is actually a demonic source, um, but I also want to say if, if you're in the room and you've dabbled in that sort of thing, we, 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 we bless you and forgive you. We're not here to condemn. We'd love to pray for you, but, but we believe the source of these things is, is demonic. It's a demonic way to, to tell fortunes, and so how many of you know when you have the kingdom of light on the inside of you and that kingdom of darkness shows up, there's something that rises up on the inside of you, and it's like, it's not okay. It's not okay. So I'm watching this happen. I'm like, this is not okay. And then somebody at the next table next to us even goes over to them and says, can you do my fortune too? The waiter comes over. I'm like, this, this is not okay. So I did um, what you would probably do, and I went to the bathroom because <laughs> I needed a moment just to pray and be alone with God. And how many of you know sometimes your greatest revelations... <laughs> It's going to stop right there. So I'm in the bathroom. It's come Holy Spirit in Italy, in Rome. Come Holy Spirit. What do you want me to do? And I get an idea that I believe is from the, from the Lord. And, and it, so, I, so, I, so I go back up. And it's a little bit awkward in Europe because the tables are super close together. So I can't really explain to Morgan what I'm going to do. So I just tell her, I'm like, hey, follow my lead. And so they're doing the tarot card reading, and I, and I lean over, and through the interpreter, I say, and through the, the one who speaks English of the two, I say, hey, you know, my name's Ryan. I, I'm actually a, a Christian pastor from America, and part of my job as a Christian pastor is to give Christian spiritual readings to people. Would you like one? <laughs> and she says, oh, Yes, and so we believe at The Rock, we believe in a gift of prophecy, a gift of hearing God's voice to speak encouragement to people. It's a, and so, so, I, so I start to, so I look at the one girl that I kind of felt like the Lord was speaking to me about, and I said, hey, I feel like um, you're called to business, and you feel um, really, really ambitious. And I feel like God said he made you that way. He made you to be successful in business. And I told her some other things, and then I said, I also feel like um, your dad isn't really close to you right now. I feel like if he was, he would tell you how proud of you he is, but because he's not close to you, he can't, but I'm here to tell you that you have a father in heaven that loves you and is proud of you. And heaven called her right in that moment. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but guess what? Where she was looking for a fortune, I got to tell her what the voice of her father was really saying about her. Where I'd seen the voice of my father, I got to show her the voice of my father. And that's the calling that's on all of our lives. So let's just close our eyes right now. There's a presence of the Lord's here. We're going to take communion right here because Jesus says that, he says, you are my witnesses. He says, you are my witnesses. And you know, the biggest thing that we've witnessed as the people of God is we've witnessed in our lives, Jesus dying and rising again for us. And that's the greatest sign. It's the greatest wonder. So just with eyes closed, we just feel prophetically this morning like Jesus wants to come and walk through our walls so he can be with us. So we can be his witnesses. So nothing can stand in the way of us and him. You know, um, we're going to talk more next week about Acts chapter 2, but this is like the preparation week as we're preparing our hearts to get ready. Um, you know, when, when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit um, for us, Jesus sent his spirit. Jesus, in that moment, died for us rose again, sent himself to live on the inside of us. What does that mean? That means we never have to be separate from Jesus ever again. And every wall we've put up is actually our own construction. So as the ushers pass the elements, we're just going to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So just feel free to pass the elements. And if you feel someone tap you, because I know your eyes are closed, just that's, that's probably communion. So you can grab the cracker, grab the juice. But here's the truth, is that nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus. And I just feel like in the room, there's some people in here where you feel really, really separated from him. Whether it's because of our own sin, our own circumstances. 
Jesus wants to come near to us tonight and I, or this morning. I also feel like there's some of us in here, maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, but we've let some walls come up. Maybe a lack of faith related to finances. Maybe um, a lack of trust related to our situation. Here's what we're going to ask as a community this morning is we're going to say, Jesus, what wall in my heart do you want to walk through this morning to be with me? So I'm going to leave a space, just a moment here for quiet reflection. Um, for some of you, this might be the first moment of quiet you've had all week. We're just going to be quiet in the presence of the Lord. We're going to say, Jesus, what's the wall that you want to walk through this morning to be with me? through this morning to be with me. I just really feel like that. Jesus really did. He knocked down every wall in order to be with us. Sin can't separate us from him. Sickness can't separate us from him anymore. Satan can't separate us from him anymore. He destroyed those things on the cross. He rose again as a sign to prove it. And then he sent his spirit to live in us so we never have to be separate again. Every wall is just our own construction. So just with eyes closed, just eyes closed, can you slip your hand up really quick if you feel like the Lord identified a wall that's in your heart or you, you kind of identified a wall? So here's what we're going to do. I think everybody has the communion elements at this point. We're going to take communion. Really, it was never supposed to be a ritual. It was always supposed to be about the relationship between God and his people, where Jesus, the night before he died, he started this meal with his disciples. And he said, hey, this is a sign of what I'm going to do for you. And as you take this meal, you're going to remember what I did. So Jesus, why don't you just go ahead and hold the cracker. Jesus, we, um, we remember this, that your body was broken for us, so we don't have to always live broken. Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us on the cross, that your body broke and broke down every wall between us and you. Every, every sin, every sickness, every ounce of Satan in our life, you obliterated it once and for all on the cross. So we take this bread in remembrance of you. Let's take this together. Let's just hold up the juice. Jesus, we thank you for your blood, which was shed for us. Thank you for the greatest sign and wonder in human history is that you shed your blood for us, but then rose from the dead. God, we drink this in remembrance of who you are and the freedom that we get to walk in because of you. We drink this in remembrance of you.